Part 1 You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have another chance to look at questions 1 to 7. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Stop your tape. Hello, Steve. How are you? Oh, I'm not too bad today, thank you, Jane. How are you? How did you go in the exams? I'm not sure. I haven't got all my results yet. But I'm so glad we're coming up to the end of the semester. I really need a holiday, so I'm going camping with some friends. What are you doing over the semester break, Steve? I haven't got any plans yet. I don't really have enough money to fly home. I suppose I could get a part-time job and earn some money, but I don't really want to. Then again, maybe I could start studying for next semester. Mm. I thought about doing some summer courses, but I decided that's not a good idea. I need a break or I'll get stale. I need to do something completely different. You do too. Why don't you join me and my friends on the camping trip? Well, I don't know, really. Would your friends mind? No, of course not. They'd be happy to have you along. We're going down to the Royal National Park. Have you been there yet? No, I haven't. It's somewhere south of Sydney, isn't it? Yes, it's about 30 kilometres south of Sydney. We'll be getting an early train from Central to Sutherland. It leaves Central at 7 and goes to Waterfall via Sutherland. Amin and Lucy are joining us there because they live in Karingbar. Oh, I see. That is very early. And who did you say will join the train at Karingbar? No, not at Karingbar. At Sutherland. Amin and Lucy. Then from Waterfall, we'll hike to where we're going to be spending the first few days. That's at Gary Beach. And what's the park like? Is it on the coast or inland? It's on the coast, but it's very big, over 15,000 hectares. And there are a couple of rivers, especially one big one, the Hacking. Can you do anything on this river? Can we go on it? Oh, yeah, lots. You can hire boats, go boating, rowboats. Rowboats? Hey, that sounds fun. Um, and what about scuba diving or horse riding? Can we do any of those things? Well, there isn't much point in scuba diving around there, as there aren't any reefs or anything. So there's not much underwater life. And because it's a national park, domestic animals aren't allowed. So what equipment do we need to bring with us if we're going? Do we have to carry our, all our food for a week? No. We've organised for the food to go down with a van, so we don't have to carry too much. You know Dave's van. It's a camper with a fridge and cooking things. So we needn't bother with that. But you'll need to bring a sleeping bag. I've got an extra one I can lend you if you haven't got one. And what type of clothes should I bring? Like, what's the weather going to be like? Bathers. Definitely bathers, because there are beaches and the river. You can swim in the river. There's some beautiful little swimming holes with waterfalls in the river. Um, good hiking boots. Strong boots and socks. I think you need a few pairs of socks, because if they get wet, it's often difficult to dry them. Otherwise, whatever you prefer to hike in... If you like shorts, that's okay. And what about my bicycle? Should I bring that? Not really. 
Well, you could. There are places to cycle, but none of us are cycling this time. You will need a warm sweater or jacket for the evenings. Oh, that's a bit of a pity. I rather like cycling, but not really on my own. And do we have to book anything, like the train maybe? No, we don't need to book the train. And we've already booked beds in the youth hostel. We've booked eight beds and so far we've only got six people. So it's fine for you to come along. And do we need a guide? Stop your tape. Jane goes on to talk about some of the activities that they can do in the park. Look at questions 8 to 11, the plan of the park and the list of activities. As you listen, write the appropriate activities in the correct area of the park. Jane does not mention every area of the park. You will have to leave some areas empty and you will not use all of the activities. You will be given time at the end of the conversation to copy your answers against questions 8 to 11. Stop your tape. And do we need a guide? Oh, no. Look, here's the map. I'll show you. Oh, good. Now, you see these arrows? Yeah. They're the marked walking trails. Right. This is Waterfall, where we get off the train. Mm -hmm. Then we'll walk to Gary Beach and stay at the hostel there. Oh, right. Okay. You see this area beyond the youth hostel to mm -hmm. the south? Mm -hmm. Those are rocky bluffs. And there are lots of animals and birds in this area. Oh, good. You can spend hours just watching them. Now, this area here, around Gary itself, has fabulous beaches for swimming and walking. Oh, great. And in some parts, there are rock pools with fascinating sea creatures in them. So there are plenty of places to swim? Yeah, there are great places to swim there. Then to the north of Gary, along the coast, there are some wonderful cliffs to walk along, mm -hmm. where you can get spectacular views. We plan to walk along here to this great picnic and barbecue place with a waterfall called Watamola. Mm -hmm. Lots of people come there just for the day to have a picnic lunch. Of course, Dave will have to drive the van. This area here is Audley. Where? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's not a town. It's just a place where two rivers join where you can hire rowboats. We'll spend the last day here, and then we'll all pile into the van so Dave can drive us back to Sutherland to get the train home. Copy the letter for the area of the map and the activity against numbers 8 to 11 in any order. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a member of the local police force giving a talk on prevention of car theft. Look at questions 12 to 19.
As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 12 to 17 according to the information given in the talk. Good evening. I know many of you students are the proud owners of your first motor vehicle. And this evening, I want to talk to you about some of the things you can do to make sure your car or motorbike isn't stolen. I'll start with a few facts and figures to put you in the picture. Car theft is a widespread problem. In this country alone, one car is stolen every 32 seconds. That's almost a million cars each year, and of those, 40% are never recovered. And don't think that just because your car might be a bit old and beaten up looking, no one will steal it. Any car can be stolen, anywhere. Most thefts occur in residential areas, often from the front of the house, or even from inside the garage. Some areas that are especially dangerous are shopping centres and parking lots, particularly at sports events. Most car thieves don't need to break into the car. They usually gain entry through unlocked doors, and many times they find the key in the ignition. In fact, one in five stolen cars had the keys left in the car. Isn't that amazing? 20% of drivers left the keys in the ignition of an unlocked car. Who steals cars? Well, there are basically two kinds of car or bike thieves. Joyriders, aged about 15 to 21, and professionals. This last group usually needs less than one minute to break into a locked car and they often steal cars to use in other crimes, such as robberies. You are much less likely to get your car back if it's stolen by a professional. And if it's stolen by a joyrider, chances are it'll be a wreck when you do get it back. Joyriders have a very high accident rate. Stop your tape. Before the final part of the talk, Look at questions 18 and 19. Now you will hear the rest of the talk. Answer questions 18 and 19. What can you do to make sure your car isn't stolen? Well, first and most obviously, lock the car when you leave it. That includes locking the boot or hatchback and making sure all the windows are closed. Even a tiny gap allows a thief to insert a wire to pry open the lock button. Of course, don't leave the keys hanging in the ignition. And don't conceal a spare key inside or outside the car. Thieves know all the hiding places. If your car breaks down, lock up before you go for help. Even if you can't start the car, a thief may be able to. Now, since dusk to mid-evening are the peak hours for car theft, Make sure you park in a well-lit area, preferably where there are plenty of passers-by, say, near a busy store or a restaurant. Avoid leaving your keys with a garage or parking lot attendant. Choose the place you park yourself. Keep your driver's license and registration in your wallet or purse, not in the glove compartment of your car. You should also have a record of your car's vital statistics, both in your wallet and somewhere at home. This can help with recovery in case of theft. And finally, it's a good idea to install some kind of safety device. There's a range available, from alarm systems that set off a buzzer or siren if an attempt is made to tamper with the car in any way, to 
fuel shut-off systems and time delay ignition systems. Displaying a warning sticker will also help deter would-be thieves. They don't want to waste time on trying to steal a protected car. So, help us to put car thieves out of business by using common sense. Always locking your car, installing anti-theft devices, and cooperating with the police by reporting any attempt. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear three people discussing university life. Listen to the discussion about reading assignments, essays and lectures. Complete the table by writing in the difficulties they have with reading, writing essays and listening to lectures against questions 20 to 24. Write no more than three words for each answer. First, look at questions 20 to 24. Now, as you listen to the first part of the discussion, answer questions 20 to 24. Oh, hello, Olaf. I haven't seen you for ages. How are things going? Hello, Lisa. Hi, Sasha. Well, it's great studying here, but some things take quite a bit of getting used to. It's not like studying in my country. Oh, I know. In my country, we used to go to lectures and get the lecturer's notes, and then we'd use those to write our essays. Here we have to read so much. I just can't keep up with it all. How do you find the reading, Lisa? Well, I agree. There is a lot to read, but I don't mind that. In fact, I like the reading. My problem is that it's all so interesting, I want to read more and more, and there isn't the time. And that creates a problem with the essays for me. I feel like I can't cover the topics in the number of words assigned. Look at this assignment, for example. I'm supposed to discuss rational choice models for my economics essays in 3,000 words. I could write a book on that topic. In fact, several people have already. How am I supposed to cover it in just 3,000 words? Why do they have to impose a word limit anyhow? Well, Lisa, remember, it's just an undergraduate essay. You're only supposed to demonstrate that you understand the concept, not apply it or anything. But I know what Sasha means about having too much to read. I think the most difficult thing with the reading for me, though, isn't the quantity, but all the new words. Words like hegemony and teleology that you need to understand thoroughly. I'm always being told by my tutors that I'm using them wrongly in my essays. And when I try to use them the same way as the reading, my tutors say it's plagiarism. I have a problem like that, too. You know, listen to the lectures and read the books and articles, and then you're supposed to come up with your own ideas for the essays. You're so full of everyone else's ideas. Where are you going to get your own from? And there's so much to say, it's difficult to organize. I spend hours planning an essay, and by the time I get to actually writing it all down, the deadline is up. I'm always having to ask for an extension. What about you, Lisa? You usually get good marks for your essays. Yes, that's true, but I'm always doing the final draft in a hurry. And then the tutors complain that they can't read my handwriting. I think I'll have to learn to type. But when? 
And that's another thing I never seem to manage enough time for, my lectures. Why are there so many? And they're always so early in the morning. I can't ever get out of bed in time for a nine o'clock lecture. Well, isn't that because you go to so many parties, Lisa? If you don't get home till one or two in the morning, how can you ever expect to be awake for a lecture? If you ask me, that wouldn't make any difference. Most of the lecturers are so boring, they put you to sleep anyhow. Why can't they make the lectures more interesting? After all, a lot of the subjects are fascinating, but the lecturers make them sound boring. Stop your tape. Now, listen as they discuss seminars and complete the rest of the table by writing in what they say about seminars against questions 25 to 27. Write no more than three words for each answer. Also, answer questions 28 and 29. Look at questions 25 to 29. Now, as you listen, answer questions 25 to 29. At least you can't say that about seminars. They're really interesting, and I think I get most benefit from them. You always find other students have read different books and articles, and so you get lots of new information in a seminar. Yes, that's true, Lisa, but I still don't enjoy them because people disagree with each other all the time, and I don't like that. I don't like to hear people arguing. It really bothers me. Oh, Olaf, you're supposed to argue in a seminar. And I really appreciate the chance to do that. Where I come from, women aren't supposed to argue or answer back. I do have to admit, however, that I get very nervous about having to give presentations. You know, when you have to read a paper. That's really scary. Oh, Sasha, I can't believe that. That last paper you gave was so professional. In fact, I think you could do a better job than the lecture. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an introductory lecture to a course on Southeast Asia. First, read the summary of the lecture made by a student and look at questions 30 to 40. As you listen, complete the summary, using no more than three words for each answer. The first one has been done for you as an example. My name is Paul Stang. I'm the coordinator of this course. It's called Southeast Asian Traditions. I'm also the author of the study guide and course reader, and you should have those in front of you. As well as these, you'll need two textbooks for the course. There's the one by Osborne and there's another by Legg. I'll talk a bit more about the reading materials in a moment. Now, if you haven't got these materials, the textbooks you can buy at the university bookshop and you can collect the study guide and the course reader from me on your way out of the lecture.
The purpose of this lecture is simply orientation. What I'm going to do is introduce myself, talk you through the course, and give you some additional advice, apart from what's contained in the study guide on dealing with the various assignments for the course. First of all, the materials. You'll find the two textbooks very clear, and they give a good, basic coverage of the history of the region. Most of the readings in the reader are fairly easy going, but I have to warn you that two of them are quite difficult. These are the readings by Smale and Bender. And of these two, the one by Bender is perhaps the more challenging. But don't let that put you off, because understanding these two readings is important to help you develop a clearer understanding of the cultures. In other words, they'll help you acquire greater sensitivity to the differences between the various cultures in the region. Now the course itself. The course has multiple aims. It's primarily a history course, but it's not only a history course. It is, in most respects, a cultural history course focusing on Southeast Asia. Nevertheless, the course is, as you'll see from the materials, an introduction to the Southeast Asian Studies components of the Asian Studies program. In looking at the cultural history of Southeast Asia, there are two major influences to be considered, the Chinese and the Indian. It is important not to forget the extensive influence that these two countries have had in the region. China has been trading throughout the region since at least the 6th century, so many of its cultural and social traditions have influenced the countries in the area. And religious practices from India have helped form today's culture. So we'll be looking for the links and the connections between traditional patterns and today's developments in the region. I think you can now begin to see how these past influences might form a background for the present day social practices. And in the same way, this course will form a basis or background for second and third year courses with their focus on the modern period and in particular the economic and political situation of the region. So that's the outline of the course. I'd like to go on now to look at what you have to do your That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.